Jeremiah chapter 18. It just so happens that I should probably stop and just say thanks to my family. Thanks, Lacey, for embarrassing me. And uh, I was cool in the 80s. <laughs> but I, I do appreciate this church and your charity and your love to me and my family. And, uh, you know, I, I'm just thankful to be alive to serve Jesus Christ and to be able to serve you. And all this other stuff is icing on the cake. It's really a blessing. And I just want to say thank you to this church for it. And uh, thank you, Bella, for playing my favorite hymn and for Ariana singing that song and making me want to cry before I preach. It's real nice of you. <laughs> um, Jeremiah chapter 18, we're going to read a couple of verses here and jump, jump right into it. Starting in verse number 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, that's what you need this morning, not my word, but his, right? Amen. Saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel. And it seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. I'd like to bring you a message this morning entitled, Starting Over. Starting Over. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning, and thank you for the sweet spirit that's in here, Lord. Thank you for the, the passion of your saints, Lord, to lift you up, to exalt you, to worship you, and... Lord, uh, the time of giving, the time of worship, Lord, the time that we're about to have in your word, Lord, I pray you bless it. Lord, thank you for the music, Lord, that reminds us of you, Lord. I do pray they see Jesus in us. Lord, I pray that uh, you'd help us, Lord, to be like that clay in your hand. Lord, I pray you'd start us over, Lord, and just continue to shape us into the perfect image of Jesus Christ, Lord, so that the world can see us. Lord, we ask for your help and blessing, and we ask all of this, Lord, and I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know what it means to be saved, Lord, that their life could start over today in Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord, we ask all of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. Recently, uh, a guy named David Angusath, for those of you that know him, you men I mentioned him earlier, he's the guy that came to our church a number of years ago, and, and he put a potter's wheel up here, and he's going to come here again next year, and and it was impressive to watch. I don't know that I've ever seen anything outside of somebody drawing while they preach that br really brings to life the, the message of the truth of a certain passage of Scripture, like Jeremiah 18, like watching a guy get his wheel out here and, and put the clay out and, and add the water as he needed to add the water and, and shake that thing and then show you how it would get, if you spun it the wrong way, it would get out of control and it would lose its shape and you'd have to start over. And all the stuff that he did, it was an amazing thing to watch. And then to see him get through and, and make this vessel, and it was beautiful, and he painted it, and it was, uh, his wife painted it, it was, it was just gorgeous. Then everybody signed it, it was here at our church at that time, and this morning I got a text from Brother Steve Kochakian, and, and his name is right over here, you know, and, and I found uh, Brother Chavers here, and there's Deborah Smith, and, and let's, there's Elvin and Rosa, and uh, let's see here, there's uh, Isabella, she signed over here somewhere, and it was really interesting because it's like, takes up half of the thing, you know, and uh, it's chicken scratch, and amazingly enough, I can't find it right now, there it is, Bella, and then she writes, Bella and Jesus, I guess Jesus helped her sign it, amen, <laughs> Bella and Jesus, John 3, 16, the rest of you, you're all lost, except for Bella, all right, she's got Jesus with her on this vessel, so, but as I looked at this in my closet, and I talked to Brother Engesath earlier this week, I thought, man, I'm glad for a God that takes a lump of clay and makes it into something beautiful. Amen. I'm glad for a God that has shown us how to find the reset button in life. Amen? Amen. And, and I thought about the fact that anyone that you'll find in the Bible that did, did anything great for God, any great man of God, any great woman of God, is someone who learned to start over. And in some cases, more than once. If you're going to do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're saved this morning... Your starting over is not just at Calvary. 
Your starting over sometimes is, is, oh, Lord, it's been six months since I got into the book and really got something out of it like I, like I used to. And God, would you just start me over? Sometimes it's a matter of getting to a place in life where you realize you're just calloused and the things that, that, are, that are eternal, the things that matter, the things that are going to matter for eternity are just so far off in your mind. And you say, God, just stop everything else. And God, would you start over with me? Sometimes it's a matter of, Lord, I tried to do something for you. I tried to serve you, and I failed at this ministry. Lord, would you help me to start over? Sometimes it's a matter of, Lord, I, I tried. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I, I got married when I wasn't saved or I wasn't right with God. And, and, Lord, I'm trying to figure all this stuff out. Lord, would you help me to start over? Starting over is not easy. But can I say this? It's the story of the Bible. It's the story of God interacting with men. Historically, Jeremiah is preaching to a group of people that several times in the first chapter of Jeremiah, when God first approaches Jeremiah, he says this to Jeremiah, be not dismayed at their faces. Be not dismayed at their faces. Be not dismayed. He says it three or four times. And I'm just thinking, I'm guessing these people don't want him around. I'm guessing that, that the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel is so far gone, it's so far uh, off in left field, they've, they've gone so far from God, that when the preacher gets up and he preaches truth, they look at him like this. And so the Lord tells them, be not dismayed at their faces, in the midst of trying to bring the truth of, of God to a people that have gone away from God. They've turned their back on God. Once you, aren't you glad that God allows you to talk to people, some people that actually want to hear the truth? Isn't that a blessing? I mean, yes, there are those that don't want to hear it, but man, it's nice to have a church full of people that are saying, Amen, I want it. Praise God for that. But can you imagine your ministry, your life calling, is to go to people that don't even want you around? That's Jeremiah's ministry. In the middle of, of going and preaching to them and having to bring God's truth to them, God says, Hey, I, I want you to take a break from all that preaching, and I want you to take a break, and I, I want you to just go down to the potter's house. I mean, can you imagine? It's like, Lord, you, you call me to only have so much time to preach to these people. And, and God, it's really important that you told me I've got to preach to them. And I've got to help turn the nation around. I, I've got all this great stuff to do. God says, I know, I know, I know. But I've got something more important than what you've been doing. I need you to go just check out the potter's house. And he goes down. The Bible says there in verse number 2, starting over, let me say this, begins with hearing God's words. Look in verse 2, arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Let me say this, look at verse number 3, starting over is part of God's work in your life, and it's not easy. You know what work is? It's work, amen? Right. Can I say this? I'm trying to help some of you. Maybe, the, the, you, you, maybe you got saved later in life. Uh, maybe you've been saved for a long time, but man, you didn't know sound doctrine. Maybe you got saved and just formed some bad habits, and those habits took 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 37 years to form, whatever it is. It took a long time to build those habits in your life, and the Lord's trying to do work in your life, and it requires starting over in certain areas. And it's work. It's not easy. But can I say this? It's God's work. The Bible says in verse 3, that he went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Let me say this. Starting over sometimes requires feeling that we're not in control. Look at verse 3. The Bible says he wrought a work on the wheels. You know what that means for that lump of clay? You know what that lump of clay is doing when the work is going on in the wheel? It's sitting there and spinning round and round. And it has no control over how fast that thing goes or how much pressure is applied. It's just going. And you know what you're supposed to be as a child of God? When you get saved, you're in His hands. And if you want to grow and you want to learn to start over, sometimes you need to learn to say, God, I am not in control. Amen. Amen. Let me say this by way of introduction as well. Starting over is pur purposeful if it's in God's hands. Look at verse 4. You see, the, the potter saw that there was an issue with the clay. That clay was marred. You know what you are this morning? You're marred by sin. You're marred by the world. You know, the Bible talks about a, a man that goes, and he goes, and he leaves Jerusalem, and he goes down to Jericho. And the Bible says he fell among thieves, and they left him half dead. 
You say, what is it? That's a picture of a man traveling through this life. And when the world is done with you, they throw you aside. They have no more use for you. And if it wasn't for Jesus Christ coming by and picking you up and putting him on his own beast and taking you to an inn like a good church and dropping you off there and saying, okay, uh, you're going to grow here. I'll come back and I'll take care of all the bills. I'll take care of all the needs. Uh, it's all on my type. If it wasn't for that, you'd still be on that road half dead or, be or worse yet, in hell. You say, what is it? God has a purpose in you starting over. Let me say this. Starting over is not about what you think is good, but what God thinks is right. Look, if you would, at verse number 4. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now, I'm not a potter, but I know this much. The clay does not speak to the potter and say, nope, I don't think I want to be a pitcher. I think what I'd like to be is a vase. No, I don't think I want to be a vase. I think I'd like to be a machine gun. No, I don't think I'd like to be a machine gun. It doesn't do that. You know, what the, you know what the clay does? It allows the potter to do his work. Sometimes you look at life and you go, well, Lord, it's all cracked. It's all messed up. And Lord says, you know what, without that crack, there are certain things you wouldn't see. There are certain things that you wouldn't understand. There are certain things that you couldn't help other people with. And you look at it and go, Lord, it looks like I'm still marred. And he goes, no, you're just fine. You see, the Lord's idea of what is good in your life and your idea are two different things. Right. Let me say this this morning. You better thank God you're not the potter. Amen. Sometimes we play God and we go, God, if I was you. Now, you don't necessarily say it like that. But it's like, Lord, God, if, if this was in my hands, this is how I would handle it. Listen, you can't see three, four, five steps down the road. You're looking at right now. You have no idea what your life would look like if you were in charge of every single thing that happened. You better thank God that you're not. Listen, I'm not a Calvinist. I know there's choices you make. I get that. But when it comes to God's design for your life, there are things that he sees that you don't. And you know what it requires, Christian? It requires for you to learn to start over. Me and my brother used to play. Hey, you already know my age. I guess I can tell you. <laughs> used to play Nintendo, the old 8-bit Nintendo. Anybody remember that? Oh, man, that's a classic. You know, you stick the thing in, push it down. And uh, I will never forget my brother. He would just go on and on. And my mom would say, you need to go do your, your homework. Order. One time my mom came in and said, que señor te reprenda. May the Lord rebuke you. She took that Nintendo. Bam! It's like she was exercising it, you know. <laughs> I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, you know. But she said it in Spanish, and it sounds so, so much scarier. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I'll never forget, you know. She says, you're going to do your homework. You're going to do this. And we're like, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. You know, and he does this stuff. And I'll never forget the next day. I said, man, I, said, I guess we need to get a new Nintendo. <laughs> he says, no. I prayed, and it worked. Look, it turned off. <laughs> There's one of two ways to reset, amen? <laughs> you can hit the button, that's the easy way, or you can be thrown down a flight of stairs, that's the hard way. That's right. Can I say this, Christian? There's an easy way to hit the reset button. That's right. I learned this a long time ago. You can do things the easy way with God or the hard way with God. If you're here without Jesus Christ, the easy way is bowing your knee today and accepting Him as your Savior. The hard way is going to hell for so many thousands of years, hearing your name called up. You go up to the great white throne judgment, stand before God. He opens up the books. He tells you everything you ever did wrong. You have nothing to defend yourself with because He's right. He washed everything. He saw your thoughts, saw your motives, saw everything you ever looked at, everything you ever said, everything you ever had in your heart. And He says, guilty, and you go out into eternity into a lake of fire without Jesus Christ. And, but you know what you're going to do before you do that? You're going to bow the knee and say, He's Lord. Wouldn't it be a lot easier to do it this way? Yes. I think so. Christian, can I say this? What we're going to do over the next several weeks is, is look at a number of people in the Bible who had to start over. And we're going to look at Abraham this morning. I want you to go to Genesis chapter 12. There may be some in here this morning that say this. I've been doing it this way too long. I can't start over. I've been lost too long. I can't start over. I formed these habits a long time ago, and I can't start over. Some might even say, all joking aside, I'm too old to start over. And let me say it like this. The story of Abraham will, I believe, provide conclusive evidence that that is not true. 
It is not too late. You are not too old. There are not too many bad habits for you to start over. Look at Genesis chapter number 12. But I want to show you some things that are going to happen if you're going to be willing to say, Lord, I want to start over. Look at Genesis chapter 12. Look at verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's what we call the Abrahamic covenant. And it's still in place uh, up to this day. Uh, but that said, historically, that's what's going on. But I want to point something out to you. I want to point out to you this. At this point, Abraham is 75 years old. Does anybody at 75 want to hear a voice come out of heaven and say, I want you to leave your father's house. Where am I going? I'll show you where. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your seed great. And I'm going to make you a blessing. And I'm going to bless you. Okay. Uh, where are we going? Just leave right now. Can I say this? Part of starting over means you leave a place of comfort. That's right. You know why some of you refuse to start over? I've always done it this way. I've, I've heard someone say, I've heard a man say this one time. I was talking to him about the gospel. He just says, well, I just always figured my whole life that God would just take my good works and my bad works and he'd weigh them out. First off, if he did that, do you actually think your goodness would outweigh your bad? Are you sure about that? I mean, do you understand how many times a day you sin? I mean, come on, be honest, be real with yourself. And I'm with you. I'm a sinner. But this guy really thought my, my good and, and my bad, gonna, you know, it's going to wait. God's going to do this kind of thing. He's going to go, okay, come on in. I said, why are you thinking? I just always thought it. Well, you go to hell believing that. Listen, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm trying to get you to understand the reason some people are unwilling and unable to start over is because they don't want to leave the comfort zone. Look in verse 2. You know what God says? I'll make something great out of you. You know what he says in verse number 2? I will bless thee and I will make thy name great. He'll make his name something it wasn't before. He'll make him a blessed man. Look at verse 2. And thou shalt be a blessing. He would make him a blessing to other people. But you understand none of that happens unless he's willing to leave home. You know what you've received? If you're saved this morning, you've received a lot of promises from God. But can I say this? If you're sitting on the shore and you're unwilling to launch out into the deep and you're not willing to leave a place of comfort, you'll sit there and you'll quote the promises, but you'll never receive them and make them your own. That's right. And you won't grow. And you won't start over. You say, why? Because I like it where I'm at. I'm comfortable. God's plan. Someone gave me a book called Adrianisms. I thought, that's a good book. <laughs> I was intrigued by the title. It was a, a preacher named Adrian Rogers. You ever heard of him? Great old time preacher. God's plan is to take ordinary people with ordinary talents and do extraordinary things through them and give glory to himself. God loves us just the way we are. Thankful for that. But, he loves us too much to leave us that way. And he wants to do? Get you away from your comfort zone. You know why I'm convinced some people walk around like this? You ever get in an elevator? Man, getting in an elevator, automatically it's like, it's like a, 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 we're, ev we're devolving. Like, man, you know, it used to be like this, you know, and well, that's what the evolutionists want you to think, you know, and slowly he comes up, now he's going back down. You get into an elevator with somebody, and you're like, good morning. They're like, hi. <laughs> you say, what is it? It's my binky. Right. It's my place of comfort. They all like me here. Right. You know what? It's a place, it's a, it's a place of comfort. It's, it's, I don't want to leave the place that I'm comfortable in. This is where I feel comfortable. This is where I know they like me. This is where I'm secure. And God's saying, as long as you want to stay there, as long as you're what well, Listen, I'll put it to you this way. When God reveals more truth to you, do you know what you were, you're accountable for? That truth. Look, when you got saved, you didn't know everything that you know about the Bible like you do now. But as you've grown, he's given you a little bit more. And you know what you're accountable for then? That truth. And a little bit more. And then it's up to you whether you're willing to go, okay, Lord, you show me that amount of truth. I'm willing to step out on that amount of truth. Because if you're unwilling to do that, you never start over. That's right. yes. You just keep going the way you're going. 
I want you to look in verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. You see Abraham's obedience. But you see Abram's insecurity as well. Look what it says in verse 4. And Lot went with him. You know what I'm convinced of? We're like, okay, God, I'll go. But I'm taking something with me. What did God say in verse number 1? He said, get thee out of thy country and from thy what? Who is that? That's kinfolk. Amen? Amen, Amen brother Mississippi? That's kinsfolk right there. <laughs> that's, that's what kindred is. It's, it's family. You say, why? He wanted something that made him feel like he was still at home. Okay, God, I'll step out. I'll leave my place of comfort. And I'm going to obey you, but I'm going to obey you my way. Now, parents, when your kid does what you tell them to do, but they don't do it the way you ask them to do it, it is a great time to teach them a lesson. Amen. And the lesson is this. I appreciate you doing what I said, but you didn't do it the way I asked you to do it. Well, why does it matter? It matters. Amen. Amen. There is a reason that God said, I want, do you guys remember the rest of what happens with Lot? Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember all that stuff? You know why that happened? Because Abram decided to say, okay, Lord, I'll follow you, but I'm going to do it my way. Okay, God, I'll leave the comfort zone, but I'm going to do it my... And you know what happens? He delays some of the things that God wants to do in his life, and he has to take time away from what God's asked him to do to go rescue Lot in Genesis chapter 14. Abram's insecurity is shown, even a good man. Abram's weakness is shown in verse 4. You say, what's his weakness? His age. He's 75. But can I say this? When I'm weak, then am I strong? You might look at where you're at in life and go, I didn't know everything then that I know now. And some people spend so much more time parking there than going, look what I know now. (laughs) At 75 years of age, do you want to like, you know, after you've built your little kingdom and you've got your boat and your RV and you've got, you know, your savings account and you've got, you know, your house and you've got the ranch house. you got Guys, he was a rich man at this point in his life. He'd made some good money. And God says, I want you. You can take some of that with you. That's okay. But I'm going to ask you to leave all the securities of home. In verse 5, it says, Abram took Sarah's wife and Lot his brother's son and all their substance that they had gathered. You see Abram's baggage there in verse number 5. God asked him to leave his comfort zone. He did leave, but he left the way he thought he should leave. Can I say this, Christian? As long as you're not willing to leave the comfort zone, you never start over where God wants you to start over. I think about Moses. Boy, Moses is a great example of this. The finest foods in Egypt. The finest education. The finest philosophers to learn from. The finest religious upbringing. And the, fi- the finest of everything that you could imagine. Being somebody that's connected to who was viewed as a god. Pharaoh thought and Pharaoh portrayed himself as him, him being a god to the people of Egypt. And, Mer- and Moses is in that very family. And here is Moses in that family. And, and you know what God does? God takes Moses and he brings him away from Egypt. And he says, okay, now you're going to be a shepherd on the backside of the desert. Well, God, I had things made. I had money. I had friends. I had fortune. I had education. And he lost all of that. What for? Nah. Nah. You know, I personally like the ones that go, man, versus the ones that go, Moses, we don't think you did a good job. For a number of years, God has Moses, not just in the desert, but on the, I love this, Exodus chapter 3 and 4, on the backside of the desert. I mean, can you imagine? That's why the the, the language of the Bible is so interesting, is it not? It's it's almost like God's trying to say, I didn't just put him in the desert. I put him where no one could find him. (laughs) Why? He had to start over. He lost all the prestige and all the popularity and you know, immediately he lost his Wi-Fi so no one could see his Facebook updates. And, and, and it was all gone. All gone. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that by faith Moses forsook Egypt. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. You say, why, how did he do that? By faith. 
God took him and had him start over. You know, God wanted Jonah to start over. You know what Jonah does? Well, Lord, you know, you're calling me to a place that's 500 miles northeast of where I live. I'd rather not go. And oh, by the way, Lord, those people hate us, and they're going to destroy us, and no thank you. Let me ask you a question. If God, I don't know, God whispered in your ear and says, I want you to go be a missionary to ISIS. I, did you say Iceland? <laughs> Lord, because uh, I hear they have a great social security program there, and, you know, it's really nice and comfortable, and I'd rather go there. Do you say, I, I'm sure you said Iceland. Maybe you said Indiana. Maybe you said Idaho, but, well, I'm sure you didn't say ISIS. You know what God did? He told Jonah, hey, I want you to start over and go to people that hate you. Yeah. 500 miles northeast of you, and Jonah refused to go God's way. I think about the disciples of Jesus Christ Look, if you would, at Luke chapter number 14. Go with me there, if you would. We'll come back to Genesis. Luke chapter number 14. I always try to encourage parents when they're coming to church and, and making church more of a habit in life, Understand that the kids, especially when they're younger, if they're older, you know, um, it, you know, it takes time to make friends, of course, and all that kind of stuff. But when they're younger and you take them to Sunday school class, you put them in nursery, it, they're looking at this place going, I'm around a bunch of strangers. I don't know who you are. Mom, why am I here? Dad, why am I here? And over time, what I always encourage parents to do is just, hey, just keep coming. Eventually, they'll get used to it. You say, why? Because what you're doing is you're taking them out of a comfort zone. They don't understand. Listen, if you're the adult here, you understand why you're here. Amen? That kid has no idea. I go down and shake kids' hands. Sometimes I can see them going, Mommy! <laughs> you know? And I'm just, I'm overly friendly with kids. I forget sometimes, you know, the stranger danger and all that kind of stuff. Hey, buddy, how you doing? They're like, ah! <laughs> man, talking. You say, what is it? They're just out of their comfort zone. Christian, if you're ever going to grow, you've got to get out of your comfort zone. Look at Luke chapter 14. Let me give you an example of this. Look at verse number 25. You know what Jesus knows how to do? People say, oh man, Jesus was here. He would know how to build a church. He would know how to break one too. Yeah. <laughs> See, what do you mean by that? Every time he starts getting a big crowd, he thins them out. Yeah. Yeah. You ever notice that? Look at Luke 14. Look at verse number 25. And there were great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, if any man come to me, he'll have a Rolls Royce. I'm going to pour out money all over him. And I'm going to bless every aspect of his life. Look what he says. If any man come to me and hate not his father, his mother, his wife, children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Any, anyone want to go, yeah, sign me up. I mean, let me join that church. You know, I mean, can you imagine if we put out a big sign and we said, where well, the Christian life is hard. I mean, honestly, that's not what the church signs say. They used to say something like this, you know, where God loves you, everyone's welcome, fine, all that stuff's fine. But imagine taking a sign going, where you need to take up your cross daily. You know? And they don't make church brochures that say that, amen? Here's the idea, though. Jesus sees these, this multitude following him, and he says, look, if you're going to start over, this is how you do it. Now, Christian, understand something. There's a difference between salvation and discipleship. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you don't need to be a disciple right now. You need to get saved first. But once you're saved, you are a child of God. The Lord wants to make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. There is a discipline. There's a character that He wants to build in your life. That means you start over. You know what that means? Well, Lord, I know how to throw a mean net. I know how to teach people how to catch fish. I don't care. Shut up. Listen, I'm teaching some stuff. Well, Lord, I'm the greatest fisherman there ever was. I don't care. We're not going to go fishing for fish. We're going to fish for men. Well, Lord, I know how to collect taxes. Well, you can just don't worry about that. We don't need to be doing that right now. We don't need to pass the plate quite yet. We just need to teach them about the kingdom that's coming. Yeah. You know, well, Lord, I know how to do this. And, and Judas comes in. I was a treasurer. Amen. <laughs> you know what the Lord says? None of that matters. We're starting over. You know what's hard for us to do? Lose influence. Be in a position where you have influence over people and then start over. Well, no one cares what you think. These disciples had lives, and God says, okay. The Lord says, okay, I want you to start over. You say, what is that? 
leaving a place of comfort. One time, Jesus Christ walks up to a man. He's in a boat. He's finishing up his day of work. He's washing his nets. You know what Jesus says to Peter? He says to Peter, uh, would you thrust out a little bit from the land? Just a little bit. And when Peter gets out a little bit and, P and Jesus is preaching to the people, he goes, you know what? Launch out into the deep. You know what you learn from that in Luke chapter 5? The Lord says, hey, let's just go a little bit. And now that you're here, let's go a little bit further. Aren't you glad Jesus Christ did that for you? Amen. Aren't you glad he left a place of comfort for you? Aren't you glad when the Bible says he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that he walked in there, and he has J Peter, James, and John behind him, and the Bible says that when they got down to pray, he says, you know what, I'm just going to go a little bit, what, further. If you're here this morning and you're heaven bound, can I say this? You wouldn't be if someone else hadn't left their place of comfort. The reason that God honors faith is because faith honors God. Faith believes regardless of circumstances and acts regardless of the consequences. Those who start over with the Lord, you know what they learn to do? They learn to leave a place of comfort. Look, if you would, at Genesis chapter number 13. Genesis chapter number 13. Let me say this. We've got to move quickly. Genesis chapter number 13. Preachers lie from the pulpit all the time. But we do need to move quickly. Genesis 13. Look, if you would, at verse number 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt. He sojourns there for a little bit, he and his wife and all that he had, and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold, and he went on his journeys from the south, even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Sometimes, you know what the Lord's going to do when you start over? He's going to remind you where you came from. You know what he did with Abram? He goes, uh, he takes him out of his father's house and he goes through this place called Bethel. And then he takes him down into Egypt. And when he brings him back, it's almost like Abram's going, I feel like I've been here before. <laughs> Ladies, have you ever been in a car somewhere with your husband? <laughs> and you're like, all you got to do is stop. See, before GPS, right? We used to, we, we, we traveled the country, and we, we did this the old-fashioned, we got the maps out, you know, we didn't have GPS, and back then, if you wanted a Garmin, it was like 500 bucks, and I'm a missionary trying to raise support to go to South America, I don't have $500 to put a, a, a box in the car so a guy or a gal can tell me where to turn, amen, I've got one right there. <laughs> Open up the map, and she would say, okay, you know, we're going to go this far, and, and, and every once in a while, we get into a place, and it's, it's almost like, well, this isn't on the map, you ever been there in life? Lord, I saw this, and I saw this, and I knew if I did this, this would happen. If I did this, the security of knowing this, this, and this equals this, and I get to this point, I go, oh, this, ain't, this place isn't on the map. Right. And I'm like, babe, come on, it's got to be on the map. And she's like, you want to look at the map? <laughs> okay, let me look at the map. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't see it on the map. Either. <laughs> Next question. Honey, why don't you stop and ask for directions? No, 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 I'm not lost. We're good. Keep driving. About an hour later, she's like, I, I think we just, we were just here. <laughs> Life is that way sometimes. You know when you start over, the Lord has a way of sort of bringing you back and reminding you where you came from and who you were. He brings him through this place called Bethel. And let me point out to you in verse number one in this chapter, he's got family. In verse number two, he has possessions. He's rich. In verse number 3, he's reminded of his beginning. And in verse number 4, look at this. Under the place of the altar which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called the name of the Lord. You know what doesn't happen the entire time he's in Egypt? There's no communication between him and God. And God brings him back to this place and goes, Remember me? You got all the money. You got all the stuff. You got the stuff you got to take care of in life. But here we are again. Let me remind you, I, I brought you back here for a reason. I wonder about the children of Israel going around Jericho seven times. And on that seventh day, man, on that last day, they go around the city seven times. Don't you feel they just kept thinking, boy, what a waste of time. Can I say some of the things that God has put you through as a Christian? You feel sometimes they're a waste of time and they're not. Sometimes it's necessary to be bought, brought back to where you started to remind you why you are on the journey that you're on.
Think about it in Joshua. You know what Joshua tells the children of Israel? They build a, a pillar. They build an altar with 12 stones. And they ask him, what's all this about? And Joshua says, there's going to come a day where your kids, kids, and their kids, and their kids, and their kids aren't going to know all the trouble we came through to get here. I want them to eventually come to this place and see this altar that was built and then go, what's this about? Yeah, that's good. Right. And you tell them, here's what happened. Here's what God did for us here. You know why God brings you back sometimes? To remind you what he's done for you. And Abram, I'm sure the whole time he's in Egypt, he's consumed with making sure the bills are paid. He's consumed with making sure that the cattle are fed. He's consumed with the wife and the kids and all things, just life, just, just life. And all of a sudden he comes to this place like, man, I feel like I've been here before. And the Lord's like, hey, Abraham, remember me? You ever feel like you're going in circles in life? Can I say this? Sometimes, sometimes that's necessary. Look at Genesis chapter number 15. Genesis 15, we'll get the life of Abraham. Can I say this? You need to learn patience. Thirdly, you need to learn patience and learn not to be in control all the time. Amen. I mentioned that earlier. You know what happens in Genesis 15? We don't have time to read all of it, but in verses 1 through 6, uh, God is talking to Abram, and Abram's going, Lord, you said that you'd bless me with a promised child. you give me a seed. And Lord, the only one that's in my house uh, that's a man that can take care of things is Eliezer, the steward that I brought with me from my house. Lord, my servant, is this all that there is? And you know what the Lord tells him? No, I've got a promised son I'm going to give you. I'm going to bless you with that. So in chapter 15, the Bible says that Abraham believed God and God counted to him for righteousness. But in chapter number 16, if you were to read that, you know what happens? Abraham takes control of the vessel and he says, you know what? Okay, God, you said you'd promise me a promised child. And Lord, time is moving and I ain't getting any younger. Amen. He's getting older. And as time goes on, he's starting to wonder, God, are you ever going to do it? So you know what Abraham does? He takes matters into his hands and listens to his wife, Sarah. People always go, well, Sarah's the one that told him to take her handmaid, Hagar. I mean, it's really Sarah's fault. I wonder to myself, well, yeah, but I don't read in the passage that Abraham's fighting too hard. Are you with me? You see what happened? He got a little impatient. Sometimes we do that. Lord, I want you to start, Lord, start working me. God, change me. God, would you do it? And God, would you do it now? Lord, it's taken me 40 years to build these bad habits, but God, if you don't fix my marriage and my kids and my bills and this in the next week, see you, God. I'm not going back to church. That's how Christians treat God all the time. Hey, listen, God has been more than patient with you. More than patient. You say, how do you know? You're breathing and you're not in hell. And if you're saved, you're on your way to heaven. Learn to be patient in his work in your life. It's like the old preacher said one time, someone said, Lord, I want patience and I want it now. <laughs> Starting over doesn't mean you get everything that God promised you in your timing. One time God speaks to Moses and he says, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock in the side of the children of Israel. Okay, Lord. And Moses, you know what happens? That all those people, they're whining, they're complaining. They're complaining about the pews and how the chairs aren't, aren't comfortable to sit on. Some are complaining it's too hot. Some are complaining it's too cold. Some are complaining they don't have water. Some are complaining. And Moses, you know what? Just shut up. Whack! And he strikes that rock twice. And the Lord says, wait a minute. Didn't I tell you to speak to the rock? Well, Lord, I knew the water was behind the rock, and it, it didn't matter. Lord, I was just, it, it didn't matter how I went about it. It just mattered that the water came out. Look, your people are getting fed. It's all good. And God goes, no, you got impatient with them. You got impatient with me. That potter sometimes looks at what he's doing and goes, mm, nah. Sometimes 30 minutes into his project. If that clay could talk, it'd be like, we've been spinning for 30 minutes. You're going to be done. It's just like, you know, on Sunday morning, preacher, you've gone 30 minutes. You need to be done. <laughs> I feel like I've been spending here long, and lo long enough. Let's get this thing wrapped up. In Jesus' name, amen. Three points in a poem, and we're done. <laughs> you, need, you need to learn. You need to learn to have patience. You know, the Bible says, let patience have her perfect work. One of the fruits of the Spirit, one of the manifestations of the fruit of the Spirit in your life is long-suffering. You know what that means? You suffer long. 
If nothing else about today's service, you know what you could learn to do? When is he going to be done? <laughs> Suffer long. <laughs> long suffering. You know what that is? That's patience. I don't know about you, but I think about the times where God has someone do something seven times in the Bible. Jericho. Joshua in the battle of Jericho. 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 Guys, that's a really fast moving song, but moving around a city seven times with an army doesn't go fast. And can you imagine what someone's thinking? Whose idea was this? Can you imagine the, the troops in the ranks? You, you have this idea that they're all like, here I am with my Bible and my hymnal, and it's wonderful. And we're just going around the city over and over and over, and it's great. No, they're like, okay, this is, this is stupid. The guys, uh, contrary to Veggie Tales, they were not throwing slushies at them. <laughs> but I do think they were probably looking at them going, what is wrong with these people? Do they not know who we are? Here we are in a position of strength. We are fortified. We've got a wall, and they're just walking around. Don't you think as they're walking around, they're going, okay, this is stupid. When are we going to be done? And God says, I'm not done yet. Go again. Lord, really? Tomorrow again? Lord, you want me to get in my Bible again? Lord, you want me to go to church again? God, do you want me to sit there again? God, do you want me to go through that thing again? Yeah, we're not done yet. Elijah, when he has this servant and he's telling him, hey, there's been the famine in the land and, and God's going to bring water. And there's going to be a couple of years of plenty and God's going to bring rain. That servant comes and Elijah says, okay, go and see if you see a cloud. Nope. He goes, okay, go seven times. You mean you want me to run there and come back seven times? Yeah. Why? Sometimes they're hard to understand. I mean, think about it. God has a sense of humor. The widow's son that Elisha raises from the dead, he sneezes seven times. I mean, after, after he sneezes once, I'm like, he's alive. <laughs> right? I mean, he was dead. He's brought back to life. He sneezes. Oh, look, he's healthy. He sneezes seven times. What was that all about? Elisha, when he tells Naaman to dip in the Jordan River, how many times did he tell him to dip? I mean, don't you think after the first one, was like, this water's gross. Someone's probably gone in this water. You know what I mean? Uh, we're downstream from some stuff. Why do I have to keep doing it? Because God said so. Right. At this point, can I, can I just point out to you, Abraham's 86 years old. You learn that at the end of chapter number 16. 86 years old. He's probably thinking, Lord, ah, time's running out. <laughs> it's like the guy that sat in the back of the church. I've told you this before, and this preacher... He's preaching, and the guy sits back there, and he points to his watch, you know. And the preacher, now there's a way the preacher's way. Just let me let, me let you in on something, okay? I can sort of nod at somebody and, and just keep preaching, and everybody else is like, okay, whatever that, you know, don't even notice it. But I'm talking with somebody. You know, there have been times where my, I've done it with my wife, like, you know, like baseball signals, you know. <laughs> you know, and she's back there, I'm like, oh, it's okay, you know. And, and, and so anyways, this guy back there, he points to the watch, and the preacher just keeps preaching. So he takes the watch off, and he goes, and the preacher goes, keeps going for 45 minutes. <laughs> you, you see what happens. Well, for you to start over, you're going to have to learn some patience. God's not in the rush you're in. You know what Jesus said? My kingdom is not now of this world. If anyone had a reason to be impatient, it was him. They're mocking him, they're defying him, they're rebuking him, they're saying he's satanic when he was doing powers and miraculous things with the Spirit of God. All that stuff's going on. And you know what I think? If I'm, if I'm him, why can't I just bring in the kingdom right now? Shut the mouths of these people and let's just get this thing going. Aren't you glad he was patient? Amen. Look at Genesis chapter number 17. Let me say this. Starting over means you need to develop an intimate walk with the Lord. Some of you may think, well, I, don't, I can't get into my Bible. I can't get into a habit of prayer. I can't get into church. I can't be a witness for the Lord. I, 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 I'm too old. I've had these habits for too long. I'm just sort of stuck in my ways. Guys, Abram is 99 years old in Genesis chapter 17. 99. It's not easy to start new habits when you're 99 years old. Amen? 
Some of you ladies are looking at your husbands going, yeah, he ain't that old. It's still hard to get him to do what I want him to do. <laughs> it's hard to start new things, but it's, it's part of God's plan in your life. And you might go, it's too hard for me. You're not 99. Look, I don't know anybody's age in here this morning outside of my wife and my kids, but I'm pretty sure nobody in here is 99 years old. You can do this. At 99 years of age, look at Genesis 17. Look, if you would, at verse number 1. When Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. Boy, those four words. And God talked with him. Five words, excuse me, him. What an amazing thing. Don't you want God to talk to you? Don't you want God to talk with you? <laughs> Listen, it's not too late. Notice the timing, he's 99 years old. It's 13 years after the whole Hagar debacle. Notice the emphasis in verse number two. I will make my covenant between me and thee. It's not about you and anybody else this morning. It's about you and God. That's what we're talking about. Notice the position that he's in in verse number three. He fell on his face. That's a great place to be if you want to get intimate with the Lord. Notice in verse number three, the conversation that takes place. In verse number five, notice the change. Neither shall thy name anymore be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. Don't you like it when God says, you know what? The world may have seen you as a sinner, but now you're my child. Amen. That's good. And you know what? You are a drunkard, but now you're my child. You are this, but now I've made you clean. You are unholy, but now you've been made holy. Listen, this may be what the world knows you for, what your family knows you for, what you know yourself for. But this is who I see you to be. You see, what does that take? Developing an intimate walk with the Lord. God's will for you is not a road map. People talk about the will of God like it's this map. God's will for you is not a road map. It's a relationship. I read this, the Christian life is like a bicycle. You're either moving ahead or you're falling off. We ought to be living as if Jesus died yesterday, rose this morning, and is coming back this afternoon. If you have an intimate walk with the Lord, that's how you live. Look at Genesis chapter number 21. We're moving. We're moving. Genesis 21. How's your walk with Jesus Christ this morning, Christian? You know, I would say the error of fundamentalism for the last 50, 60 years in, in good churches has been this. If you're busy in ministry, then you're spiritual and you're close to God. That's not always the case. How's your relationship? Is it sweet? Is it intimate? Does God talk with you? Look, if you would, at Genesis chapter number 21, let me say this, starting over means you learn to do the hard things regardless of a number of things. Look at uh, Genesis 21, look at verse number 9. Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born in Abraham, mocking. You say, what happened? Well, surprise, surprise. You know, you have a kid with another woman that's not your wife, and you have problems. <laughs> Who would have thunk that, right? And so it's, it's almost like Abram's going, oh, this wasn't a good idea. Right, amen, not a good idea. So Abram's got this son in his house, Hagar's son, and, and Hagar, or Hagar's son, Ishmael, is mocking Abraham, he's mocking Sarah, and there's conflict in the home. Abram is now 100 years old. You know what's hard to do at 100 years old? It's hard to do some things that run contrary to your flesh. You know what made sense to Abraham? We'll figure this out. You know what God tells Abraham? You send Hagar and the boy away. You know what that is? That's a hard thing to do. You say, why? Well, I created the problem. Lord, I'm the one that broke this piece. You know, I thought about bringing it when I was... Bringing this to church, I thought, someone's going to ask, how did that happen, Pastor? And I was going to say, I broke it. <laughs> it's my fault. Sometimes we look at the piece that's broken, we go, Lord, I messed it up, I'll fix it. Sometimes the Lord's like, you're not going to fix it the way you think you're going to fix it. Because if Abraham had fixed it the way he thought he would fix it, that, that whole separation of Hagar and Ishmael from the family wouldn't have happened. 
God says, Abraham, I know this is hard for you to do. I know it's the last thing that makes sense. I know it's not what's comfortable for you. I know it doesn't make sense in your eyes. But Abraham, I want you to go ahead and do the hard thing. Can I say this for some? You know what the hard thing is? Coming to church. For some, you know what the hard thing is? Keeping your mouth shut when you're, when you're in an argument with your spouse. You know what some of it, for some of you know what it is? It's a number of things. It's being a parent to your child for the first time in your life. You used to let the kid decide whatever they want to do. Now the Bible's showing you that's not right. You gotta go, hey kid, this ain't how we're gonna do this. And they're fighting back, and you're going, what do I do? Do the hard thing. Because it's right. And Lord, I, I've never been a witness. I've never made myself a fool for Jesus Christ. And now I realize it that I need to do that. I need to open my mouth for him. What should I do? The hard thing. Well, I'm too old. No one's going to listen to me. I've been doing it this way for too long. I'm stuck in my ways. He's 100 years old. And God tells him to do the hard thing. And he does it. Can I say this in Genesis 22? We're moving quickly. You'll find out that you need to learn to sacrifice. See, what does God do with Abraham in Genesis 22? He says, give me your son, your only son. You know what God's going to ask you to do sometimes? Look at the thing that you love the most and the thing that you, re- that you look at and you say, that's a reflection of God's promise in my life. When you look at something in your life and go, that's God's blessing, God says, I want it back. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. So I want to start over. God, I want my life to be new. I want the best stuff gone. Lord, I want you to build my character. I want to walk closer with Jesus Christ. Okay, it's going to mean some sacrifice. Well, God, is there a way to sort of bypass that and sort of, can I say this? You know what? I've been married to this woman for 18 years. And, and every time I say it, she goes, we haven't gotten there yet, baby. <laughs> July 29th marks 18 years. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. She says all the time. All right, 17.10 years, whatever it might be. You know what I've learned, though? Man, it's a sweet thing to be married to her. You know what's cost, though, on both sides? A real good marriage, what you have to do is learn to work and sacrifice some things. The more you invest into something, the more it means to you. You know why it is that you can shout at a football game or get excited about something and come to church and does your flat line? You're not investing anything. There's no sacrifice. And sometimes what God asks you to sacrifice is different than what he will ask somebody else to sacrifice. You say, preacher, I want to start over. Okay. Learn that when you start over, it's going to mean you learn to sacrifice some things. Let me say this. Genesis chapter 25. We're moving quickly. This is the last point here. It is only the life that is lived with the approval of Jesus and in the authority of Jesus that will bring a claim to Jesus. So, Lord, I want my life to count for something. Lord, would you help me to start over? Lord, I want to start over. When we think of starting over, you know what we think of? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. What a great promise. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. But even after you get saved, there's some errors where God wants to go, okay, we're going to have to change the way you look at this. We're going to have to change the way you, you, you talk about that. We're going to have to start over in this particular area of your life. We're not going to keep this the way it's been for all these years. We're going to start over. Okay, Lord, that sounds good. And as soon as the Lord says, okay, I want you to give that up, well, Lord, you didn't tell me that. I'm telling you right now, right. starting over means sacrifice. Can I say this? Starting over means you're ready to take your last breath. Boy, I've been reminded of this more and more lately than I ever have, I think, in years. Being around people who are dying, being around people whose families uh, are, are passing away. And we have some that are with us this morning who have some family that recently passed away. And you want know to realize, you know what we all need to realize? Someday you will take your last breath. It's coming. I, I read this this morning. I thought, boy, what a thing. I'm not going to give you the guy's name, but I'll just say this. Our dear brother, such and such, was born November 4th, 1951 at Chanute Air Force Base, Illinois, and passed away March 28th, 2018 at his home in Aurora. Uh, It says, uh, he was a man of few words, just like many other brilliant minds that have come and gone in this world. His brilliance uh, is proven in his undeniable passion for photography, screenwriting, uh, cooking, and telling awesome jokes. He even produced, starred, and directed his own films that he hoped would have made it to Hollywood one day. He survived by such and such. His unusual demeanors were often misjudged. It is only now, after our great loss, that we're discovering what a benevolent old man he truly was. There is no doubt the heavens above have a special place just for you, brother. Please forgive us. We love you. We're sorry. 
too late. It's too late. You know when you can start over while you have breath? I read this. This guy was an IT systems administrator, and this is in the Denver Post. This guy uh, was born in Littleton, Colorado, got his, uh, uh, graduated high school from Smoky Hill High School, went to CU Boulder with a Bachelor of Science Information Systems, and he just passed away. You say, how old was he? 39. Right. This isn't just for 80-some-year-old people. Right. Right. I could go on and on and on and on. Look at Genesis chapter number 25, and let me show you some things here. You'll learn about Abraham. In Genesis chapter number 25, verse number 5 says, Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Can I say this? Because you have started over, you should pass on everything you have to those around you. I don't just mean, I don't mean material wealth. I'm talking about if you're saved this morning, you have started over in Jesus Christ, you ought to be telling everybody you know about Jesus Christ. You know what evangelism is? It's one beggar telling another beggar how to find food. Pass it on to your kids. Pass it on to your church. Pass it on to your neighbors. Life is too short. Eternity is too long. Souls are too precious. The gospel is too wonderful for us to sleep through it all. I want you to notice he passed it on. Look, if you would, at verse number 7. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived in 103 score and 15 years, 175. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. You know what you want when you take your last breath? To know that you're going to be gathered up there. If you're here and maybe you've been a good person, maybe you've been religious, but I'll tell you this, regardless of what you might think of yourself, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not ready to pass on. You are not ready to start over. You are not ready to take your last breath. You need to start over today. There are some of you maybe that have heard the gospel over and over and over and over and over, and you've never made the decision. You say, you know what? I'm religious. I've been baptized. I was born in a Baptist church. I was raised in a Baptist home. I was this. I was that. If you die without Jesus Christ paying for your sins, you'll go to hell. That's right. I'm not saying that out of pleasure. I have no pleasure in saying that, but it's true. Guys, can I ask you this question? If Jesus came to save us, what did he come to save us from? He's the Savior of the world. From what? Well, my sin. Where, where is your sin going to take you? What is the punishment for that sin? I'll tell you what it is. It's an eternal place called hell. And God doesn't want you to go. And you might think, well, why should I? Why would I have to go to hell? I'm not as bad as such and such. I'm not as, I never killed nobody. I never stole. I never did this. Listen, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. You committed a crime against an eternal God, and he's holy, and he's sinless, and he's pure. And if you walk out of here and say, no thanks, preacher, I'll take my chances, you don't know if your name might show up in here next week. You say you're trying to scare me into heaven. If I could, I'd do it. I know I can't do that. It's between you and God. But the truth is, at some point, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Boy, you want to get to the end, and you want to go, man, it's been good. 175 years. And I told everybody I could. I gave them what I knew. And into the arms of Jesus Christ you go. That's you if you started over with a new birth. But if you never have, can I say this? Don't risk your eternal soul. Don't gamble with it. You don't know what comes tomorrow. And let me say it this way. It is appointed unto men. I'm, I'm giving you a Bible. It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. You see, you, you act preacher like God's up there going, I just want to judge them. No, not at all. He loved you enough to die for you. And the message of the gospel is so simple and so easy. 
that people want to make it more difficult. Why? So they can have a part in it. God, I think I, I, think I, I like how you did this whole salvation thing, but let me add my own impression on there. Because after all, uh, the gospel can't just be that Jesus Christ died for our sins and, and, and was buried and rose again third day according to scriptures. It can't just be that by faith I accept what you did for me on the cross. Let me put my own impression on there. And God says, don't get, get your hands out of it. You have no idea what you're doing. I'm the master potter, amen? If you're here without Jesus Christ, the only way you're going to get there is by trusting what He did for you on the cross. Amen. Receiving Him by faith. Salvation is not in a religion, a church, or baptism, or any other thing. It's in a person named Jesus Christ. Amen. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. If you're here this morning, you're going, Preacher, you're making me nervous. If you're nervous, can I say this? Take care of it today. Amen. Christian, can I ask you a question? Do you ever find yourself using the excuse, It's too late. I've done too much damage. I'm too old. I've had these habits for too long. Instead of letting God start over some things in your life. Abraham proves it's not too late while you're still breathing. And God can do some amazing things in your life if you let him. Let's all stand. Let's all stand.